We can just put the mic volume a bit up. Testing, testing, 717. I'll be lying in a shaitan, a rahman, a rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, was salatu was salamu ala ashraf al anbiya wal mursaleen. Khatam al nabiyin, sayyidina wa sayyid al awalina wal akharina bil qasimi muhammad. على آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتخبين المنتجبين المظلومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أما بعد my respected brothers and sisters my elders and learned scholars السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته continuing in the same theme of discussion and discourse that we've been having for the past new few nights that concerns the reform of the Shias on a personal level, on a community level, and in the general society, which is what we will be speaking of today. The title of today's talk is Media and Misconceptions, the Misrepresentation of the Shia of Ahlul Bayt alayhum as -salam. What do we mean by that? Our talk will be based in threefold. In the first instance, we want to talk about what's been happening in the world when it comes to the understanding of the Shia from the outside world. How have the people approached this concept of the Shia of Ahlul Bayt Allah? How have they tried to understand or rather misrepresent the school of Bayt, uh, the school of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam Allah. That's point number one. Point number two, we want to look at what we have done to either continue fueling this misrepresentation of the Shia through our incompetence, through our passive behavior, and through our lack of interaction with the general public. And point number three is what can we do in order to change our lot and to better our state of affairs. Aflaha man salla ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. There is an Egyptian scholar and he wrote a book, Islam the Misunderstood Religion. Now I come from a media background. As in, that is my major. Although I don't work in the field any longer, but nevertheless, I understand how it operates. A title such as Islam, the misunderstood religion, the word misunderstood indicates that to some extent, those who have misunderstood Islam have made a genuine attempt to, at the very least, try to understand Islam. But when we see the representation of Islam in the Western world, we find that it is far from the truth. That there hasn't been a genuine interest in trying to understand Islam from its political angle. Islam from the social aspect. Islam from the family aspect, the financial aspect, and all that is that comes with a holistic religion and a complete way of life known as Islam. Rather, what we find in the West, there is constant criminalization of this religion. That whenever something happens, Islam is represented as a religion, or rather misrepresented, as a religion of violence, as a religion that suppresses the rights of women, that it gives no, absolutely no right to the women, that Islam is the religion of men, and it is about the authority and the power of men, and not just the general man in on the general aspect of the word, but rather the men who are from the eastern side of the world. As an example, and I will give you two examples to make you better understand how this misrepresentation has affected us 
we the Muslimin in general, Sunni and Shia alike. Only very recently, a number of days ago, if you've been watching the news or reading the papers in LAX, the airport, there was an individual there with an AK-47 or an M-16 or whatever other kind of firearm that he was carrying, ended up shooting in the airport, one of the most highly secured places, and killing some innocent people, yet it wasn't headline news. It was an issue of national security, but it didn't make the headlines the same way if it was a Muslim person carrying that gun. When a Muslim person, or rather we are told he's a Muslim, maybe that individual has no, no, no understanding of the religion of Islam, only makes a plan to attack the people in the West. He hasn't actually killed anyone, but if they just make a plan and they are caught in in the plan process, it's worldwide news. Muslim terrorists, Muslim extremists, Muslim this and Muslim that. And the problem is, Islam is a religion that does not welcome cowards. But we all act like cowards and we all hide underneath our beds and we wait for the storm to weather away. No one comes forward and challenges the status quo. No one comes forward and says, listen, these people do not represent my faith, nor do they represent my God, nor do they represent my Prophet Islam is a religion of peace and prosperity, and I am going to explain that to you. Rather, we all worry about our personal interests, and we don't want to be the person under the limelight. That is the difference between a general Muslim and Sayyid al-Shuhada Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. Imam Hussein, in the most dire of situations, under the most difficult circumstances, and it wasn't just the threat, the verbal threat of death and captivity of his women and the loss of limb and life and the loss of property, but it was a physical threat, one that was implemented and manifested in the land of Karbala. Yet it did not deter Sayyid al-Shuhada from standing his ground and protecting the values of this religion. And the way in that he protected these values, he did not take a sword and kill people, but rather he said, Islam is not a religion of killing others. Islam is a religion worthy of me dying for its cause. I don't take life for the religion of Islam. I give life. I give my life. I give the life of my beloved Ali al-Akbar. I give the life of my beloved Qasim ibn al-Hassan. I give the life and the security and the safety of the women of my household. Because this is the religion that I believe in and I will stand to defend it whenever somebody tries to change its face and change the value of this religion. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa A joke that used to be told in our media class. It says in the city of New York, and ironically I should tell the joke when I'm in the Big Apple, as rotten as this apple is. The joke says that there's a lady who's attacked by a dog. Now I won't say from what religion she comes from, but she works in the media industry. I think that's enough for you to have as a clue. This lady is, a, is attacked by a wild dog. And all of a sudden, this guy who just came from Pakistan, looking for a better life, chasing the American dream, happens to see everybody's walking past, not helping her. But because he comes from a part of a world where we're supposed to care for one another, he kicks the dog in order to save her life. But being a Pakistani, mashallah, he's got some power in his legs. When he kicked this dog, the dog dies. So the lady turns around and she says to him, thank you. Thank you, O noble American citizen. You are truly upstanding and upholding the constitution. As in, you know, you're supposed to care for one another. He says, no, actually, I'm not from here. I'm from Pakistan. She says, ah, okay. So now she was intending to write a report about him. The title would have been a brave American citizen puts his life at risk in order to save another citizen. But when she found out for he's from Pakistan, 
The next day, the New York Times wrote, Muslim terrorist attacks American dog. You see how the status quo changes. When it's a Muslim, it's a totally different story. So there has been a misrepresentation of this religion. And we can be naive and say this has been a misunderstanding of Islam, but we cannot beat around the bush and lie to ourselves that there is a systematic approach to criminalizing this religion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. That's on one instant. <clears throat> Let's look at the misunderstanding of the Shia. So already we see that these people are not trying to understand Islam. But let's see how they came to the religion of Shia Muslims. And when we say they, we're talking about the West and the non-Muslims. The West approached Islam from three doors. First, through the Ottoman Empire, which is today's Turkey. Second, through Egypt and Cairo, sorry, Egypt and Damascus. And third, from India. Now let's look at the situation here. In the first instance, in the age of the, you know, enlightenment as the French call it, when these French theory writers and revolutionary thinkers wanted to understand Islam, they didn't go to Medina, they didn't go to Karbala, they didn't go to Najaf to understand Shia Muslims. They went to the closest Muslim country that was there, i.e. the Ottoman Empire, the Turks. Predominantly, they didn't have a good understanding of the Shia themselves, as in the Ottoman Empire. They did not like the Shia. They did not adhere to the values of Ahlul Bayt. Yet since they did not understand Ahlul Bayt, they did not represent the Shia faith as the Shia faith should be represented. If you want to understand who are the Ottoman Empire, it's quite simple. First, we had, after Rasulullah, we had the four Khalifas. After the four Khalifas, we had the empire of Bani Umayyah alayhum la'natullah. Bani Umayyah, they had a war with Bani Abbas and Bani Abbas overthrew Bani Umayyah. When Bani Abbas overthrew Bani Umayyah, they employed the Turkish slaves, an entire state of slaves, they employed them as a standing army. That was the Ottomans. The Ottomans became fed up with the Abbasid regime, so they turned against them, because the Abbasids, they were known to have many civil wars amongst themselves. So the Ottomans overthrew the Abbasid Khalifas and they took over this empire known as Islam. Generally, when we look at these three empires, not a single one of them had a genuine concern for the Muslim world. It was all about who can succeed the most powerful seat in the world at that time. So therefore, if you're asking the Ottomans to describe Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam Allah, who only yesterday we said was such a personality that he would not use a candle when he needed to. He would not do injustice with the light of a candle. People who are usurping your tax money and your wealth and they're sending you to war that Allah did not sanction, they're not people who understand Ahlul Bayt. So they are not worthy and not fit enough to describe to the Western world who are the Shias and who are their Imams. And they have no authority to represent us. In the second instance, we had the British Empire who had an invested, they had invested their interest in the Indian subcontinent. And therefore, when they came to understand Islam and the Shia Muslims, they understood it through the Indian discourse. And India at the time was very much under the influence of Ahl Sunnah. And again, the Sunnah are not really the best people to describe the Shia since they do not even accept us as Muslims. Some of them say killing us is halal. Some of them call us the children of Muta. Some of us call us a nation of weepers, and I say some, not all Sunnis, but we're talking here on the level of the scholars. 
So therefore you cannot ask the Sunnis to come and represent us and our madhab. And finally you had the Jewish community who came to study Islam through Egypt, through Damascus, and through Morocco. Morocco at the time would have included Tunisia and Algeria. But let's look at who owned these parts of the world in the time of studies. Egypt was under the control of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, who the first thing that he did, he employed the Shias as his army because he knew they had the bravery of Ali ibn Abi Talib in their heart and the blood of Abu Abdullah al-Hussein in their veins. So he employed the Shias. And when he won his seat of power and secured it through the blood and the sacrifice and the selflessness of the Shia, immediately he put a fatwa, kill every Shi'i person. So Egypt was under the throne and under the government of somebody who used and abused the Shias and he loathed them. Damascus had been under the influence of Bani Umayyah for more than a hundred years. And Bani Umayyah are the very same people who used to systematically say Ali ibn Abi Talib did not even pray Salah. To the extent of their propaganda and cursing Imam Ali every single khutbah that when Imam Ali was shaheed in the mihrab and news had reached the people of Damascus that Ali was killed in mosque, everybody was scratching their head saying, what was Ali doing in mosque? Ali doesn't even pray. When Ali is the pillar of salah, as the poet says about Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, he says, oh Ali, you know the ways to the heavens better than we know the ways to the earth. So how does my salah reach Allah unless it goes through the guidance of Ali? As in nobody else knows the route to Jannah. Nobody else knows the route to paradise. Nobody knows the route to Allah except Ali. So if my salah has been entrusted to the hands of anyone but Ali, my salah is not even going to reach the ceiling. I can guarantee you that much. So these are again not people worthy or fit or an authority to represent the Shia of Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam in their honor, sallu ala nabi <coughs> When the Abbasid Khalifas, we said they overthrew the Bani Umayyah. When the Abbasid Khalifas overthrew Bani Umayyah, Bani Umayyah, they ran off to what is known as Morocco today. So again, it's the same people who have no right to represent us. Now you can understand, and we will turn a blind eye to this, you know, uh, conspiracy theory, should we say, that somebody is always trying to criminalize the Muslims because it suits the interests of country X, Y, and Z. We don't want to get into politics. But let's give these people the benefit of the doubt. Even if they were sincere in trying to find the truth about the Shia of Ahlul Bayt, alayhum salam, they were searching along the wrong streets. There is no way on earth or in heaven they would have found the truth about Ahlul Bayt Allah, and the true values of Ahlul Bayt because they were asking the enemies of Ahlul Bayt to describe Ahlul Bayt. And if you read the academic literature about Ahlul Bayt and about the Shia religion from Oxford University, to every other university, and we're talking less than a hundred years ago, each and every book talks about the Shia as a bunch of heretics. Because that is how the world of the Ahl Sunnah, the 80% majority of the Muslims, represented us. We were not in a position of power to represent ourselves. But less than 10 years ago, the rules changed. And I want to talk about the last 10 years in our history. And I want to talk about how we, as a nation, as a community, as a people, through our lack of understanding of this misrepresentation and how media works and how media can be effective, because media is a double-edged sword, because of our lack of understanding of the internet, we have continued to fuel the fire of the misconception that has been overclouding the Shia religion of Ahlul Bayt We have Facebook, 
We have Twitter. We have YouTube. We have blogs. We have Allah knows best what we have. But in a nutshell, we have had access to the best thing that could have happened to us, yet we used it in the worst possible way. We have a platform known as the internet where we can come forward to the world and represent ourselves and tell them that nobody else needs to talk about us. Forget what the Sunnis say, forget what the Turks say, forget what the Egyptians say, forget what Saudi Arabia says. Take it from our own mouths. We are the Shia. Let us tell you. Yet tell me, how many short movies have we had? I mean, how difficult is it? You get yourself a Canon camera. I'm sure every Jamaat has more than $1,500 in his treasury box that they can spend on a DSLR camera and more than $300 to send one of their bright youths to take a short course on filmmaking and documentary making. And we go out and we make a short film about what it means to be a Shia living in New York. A small documentary about life as a Shia, what we believe. A small documentary about what would this city of New York be like if Ali lived amongst us or if the values of Ali lived amongst us and we make a short five to ten minute video, a short clip. It doesn't take much work and we put that video out there. What would it take to sit a Maulana down and interview Maulana on issues that address our needs? And I don't mean our needs as Shia, Muslims, Ethnashiris. I mean our needs as American citizens living in a far city known as New York from the drug abuse that people have to face, from the alcohol abuse that people have to face, from the girlfriend, boyfriend related issues, from the issues pertaining to family breakdowns and dysfunctional families. This is the thing that we need to be addressing. Maulana, with all due respect, you can talk about Pakistan and Iraq and Bahrain all day long. But the matter of the fact is, I live in New York, I live in London. There is no way that I can do something to change their lot. So tell me how I can change my lot. Because you are here to address my needs. And once I can address my needs, then I can worry about the needs of others. It's a sad reality, but it's a truth. Instead, our youth are spending more than six hours a day on Twitter talking about what they had for breakfast, what new shoes they bought, who's gossiping about who. A girl or a boy in New York, Sydney Jamaat, slips. The guys in Tanzania know about it before he reaches home because it's like this. Instantaneously, we gossip on our Facebook. <laughs> Email spread like wildfire. Blackmail. And this is the issue that I was talking about just two days ago, that we need to come away from this and we need to begin to work as a collective community because it's not just this Jamaat at stake, it's our representation that's at stake. When 9-11 happened, I ask you by Allah, how many people came up to you and said, you know what, you're a Shia Muslim. We know you've been victim of the same radical Islam for 1,400 years. We know you had nothing to do with this. Or did you suffer the same level of discrimination as everybody else? The level of misunderstanding in the West of the people is such that even Sikhs were being attacked because they had a turban and a beard and they looked like Osama bin Laden. It's a sad reality. We need to capitalize on this thing called the internet. We need to capitalize on this thing called www dots. We need to use the Facebook and the Twitter, but we need to use it in a good way. We need to start working and investing in our youth because they are the ones who have to face the community. Uncle A and auntie, you know, auntie, maybe you don't need to face the community. Uncle, maybe you're coming to a retirement. Maybe uncle's got a fancy car, he doesn't need to take the train or the subway. He gets in his car, he drives into work from his office in his car into his house. He didn't meet a single stranger. But your son has to take the public transport to school. Your son has to mingle with the other people. Your daughter likewise has to mingle with people. She needs to now explain why she must wear hijab. Empower them. Invest in them. Don't waste them away like this. But instead of utilizing the internet, what did we do? 
We take pictures of our majalis. They're taking place in Urdu and Arabic and God knows what other language, but not in English. And we post them on YouTube. And I'll tell you something. If I was in a Shia Muslim, and I saw a video of people slapping themselves and hitting themselves with blades and cutting themselves and bleeding, and I can't understand what language they're talking in, I'll tell you straight up, and you'd be lying to yourself if you don't think the way I think. You say, these people are barbaric. You wouldn't think that they are mourning about Abdullah Hussein alayhi salam Allah. You wouldn't think that they are reliving values of humanity and nobility. You wouldn't understand any of this. I'm not saying Zanjir, Zanjir and Kama, Zanjir are bad. What I'm saying is, don't put it in a language that people don't understand and expect them to understand what you're doing. Because if you go onto YouTube, or if you go onto Google, and I just want you to do this, it's going to take two minutes of your time. I don't mind if you pull out your phones for this one. But just type in the word Shia. I promise you, do it. Type in the word Shia on your phone in Google, and go to images, and tell me, do you see pictures of scholars? Do you see pictures of knowledge and invention and great things that we have given to the world or do you just see people with blades as in if you don't know who the shia people are and that's what you saw what would you think it's a question worth asking we need to begin to populate the internet with our literature with our philosophy with our understanding with the akhlaq of ahlul bayt with videos and documentaries and and whatever blogs that you have we need to begin to do that. Because the internet is the cheapest and the quickest way for us to represent ourselves. Why are we letting other people represent us when we can do it? And don't tell me you live in New York and you got fast life. Because believe me, I see most of you on Facebook and you're tweeting about and you're writing all these posts on Facebook that are irrelevant. You have on Facebook, okay, Bana, talk to whoever you want to talk to. But just spend two seconds by saying, I love Abba Abdullah al Hussein because he taught me how to live like a free person. I love Sayyida Zainab because she taught me what it means to be an empowered woman. I love Ali al Asqar because he taught me that regardless of how old or how young, I can still serve a role in my community. Simple statements, and they will bring about change. But I tell you one thing that holds us back. I tell you realistically one thing that holds us back and it's the same thing that I've been talking about for the past two days. The thing that holds us back is that we know each other. Have you ever had that situation when you know your friend too well and you know the guy doesn't know nothing about mathematics and all of a sudden he tries to talk like he's the most genius, like you know he's Einstein and you just tell him, look sit down please, this is not for you to talk about. Immediately we put each other down, correct? Immediately. When it comes to representing Ahlul Bayt, sometimes when someone says something, we say, yeah, but who are you to talk? You're the guy that used to do drugs just two years ago. Or who are you to talk? You're the guy that never used to pray Salah on time. And instead of listening to the good that the person is saying, we're reminding them of the bad that they were doing. Instead of helping a person to perfect themselves and move forward, no, we pull them back. I'll give you two examples and two stories. And then the third one will be our conclusive point. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. The first one is about your responsibility when you find a flaw in an individual, what do you do? Because Islam is a religion of responsibility. Does anybody disagree with me here? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran al-Kareem, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, qifuhum, innahum mas'ulun. He's telling the angels, bring me the children and the daughters of Adam. The angels say, Ya Allah, why not the donkey and the cow and everybody else? Why just the sons of Adam? He says, innahum mas'ulun, because they were responsible creatures. They had responsibility and they were capable of administrating that responsibility. So we all have a responsibility. Different roles bring about different responsibilities. As a father, I am responsible to provide for my children. As a mother, I'm responsible to provide love and care for my children. As a friend, I am responsible to give sincere advice. 
And as a Shia, it is my responsibility to conceal the mistakes of everybody around me. I don't go around bragging about it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran al-Kareem about backbiting and about spreading fitna about one another. He says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Would you like to eat the flesh of your dead brother? And then you despise it? Do you know what that means? When they asked our Imam, Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salam with regards to this verse, they said, Ya ibn Rasulullah, why did Allah say dead brother? And then why did he say you despise it? What's the despising got to do with it? How many doctors do we have in this room? I'm sure we've got a couple, I know some of you. A simple rule in a living human being. When you're injured, your body rebuilds itself. Correct? Your wounds, they heal. But if you're dead, can your wounds heal? No. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do you want to eat the flesh of your dead brother? That means when you take from his izzat, when you take from his dignity and respect in the community, there is no way that this is going to heal again. Because everybody will forever remember this person for what you spoke about them. And then you hate it. Because when you see how you screwed someone over, and I'm using the general terms that we use publicly. Don't tell me I'm sitting on the you know, pulpit of Imam Hussein alayhi salam and I can't talk this way. The member of Imam Hussein does not shy from any situation because it's here to help better the situation. But when you totally ruin someone's life and you see how much they are suffering because of what you told about them and you despise it, you are still incapable of changing things. So do not eat the flesh of your dead brother because soon you will despise it. But soon is going to be too late for change. You talk about a girl, and this happens a lot in our communities. And I only mention the sisters here because just the way that men think, I guess, or the way that society thinks. And it's not just something within the Muslim world. It's everywhere you go. When a woman does a small thing, it will stick to her for the rest of her life. And when a man does a million bad things, it doesn't stick. I don't know, maybe we're using a different shower gel or something. But the problem is, guys, and I'm talking to the youngsters here especially, and I tell you what my father told me. You see, in high school, you're going to mess around. And then... When you come to find a wife, you're going to want a woman who's never been touched by anybody else. She's never spoken to anybody else. What gives you the right to give her something broken, but she has to give you something fixed? I'm just talking common sense. The way my father raised me, alhamdulillah, is he said, whenever you're about to do something with somebody else's sister, ask yourself how you would feel if someone was doing that with your sister. And we have this problem in our community where the moment something happens, we speak about it and we ruin that person's life that even if they want to be good, they can't be good because tomorrow no one's going to come and propose to her. Or tomorrow no one's going to give you a daughter. You know, they say, wait, wait, this guy, the one who used to mess around with the girls in college, he wants my daughter. No, thank you. I'm not going to give it to her. So don't be the kind of person who you use the internet and all this world of fast communication and mobile phone technology to spread fitna about each other. Use it for a correct purpose. Use it to spread love of Ahlul Bayt Allah, and button up your lip about the bad that you know in your community. Let me ask you something. When you look at the Hindu community and the Sikh community and the Jewish community, do we know what goes on in their houses? No, because they keep a tight lip about everything that happens. Am I right or am I wrong? But in our communities, unfortunately, our good stays in the mosque, our bad goes outside the mosque. We don't preach love of Ahlul Bayt, we don't preach what we learn on the mimbar, 
We preach whatever happens behind closed doors and it's supposed to be behind closed doors. We've twisted the whole situation around. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Do not eat the flesh of your dead brother or your dead sibling and then you hate it. And I'll give you an example. There is a story that has been told a number of times, but when I was researching this story, I found a number of different variations about who said it and when it was said, but suffice it to say that it happened in the age of one of the prophets. And in the age of one of these prophets, there is a man, and this man loves to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Iblis becomes angry with his minions. And he says, I've been sending you to this guy time and again, and he is still praying. They said, boss, we tried enticing him with money. He doesn't like money. We tried enticing him with women. He doesn't like women. We tried enticing him with whatever alcohol, whatever haram. He's not interested. All he cares about is worshipping Allah. You know what Iblis said to them? Then you're very stupid. Because the son of Adam is weak, you find what he likes and you use it against him. It's that simple. So Iblis goes to the place where this person prays in the form of a human being and he is hovering in the air and he's in sujood. So now this guy comes and he sees another human being floating around in a state of absolute khushu. He says to him, Salam alaikum salam. He says, my dear brother, how did you reach this level of taqwa and iman that Allah has enabled you to elevate yourself, to levitate? He said, have you not heard, have you not heard that Allah loves those who repent? In Allah, we have tawabi. Allah loves those who repent. He said, yes, I've heard it. He said, then what I do is I commit adultery and then I repent and Allah loves me more. I steal and I repent and Allah loves me more. I lie, then I repent, and Allah loves me more. Until I was loved so much by Allah that I have reached the situation where I am today. Because Allah loves the repenters. And if I'm not sinning, Bana, then I can't repent, can I? So he says, and what must I do? He said, the worst of crimes to commit in the, in the presence of Allah is adultery. So go to the red light district, as they call it. Do your deed and come back and repent and you will be where I am. Imagine how well this guy was known that when he went to a lady's house and he knocked at the door and he said, I'm here to do the business. She said, you? No, 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 no. Something is definitely wrong in the world. You're the most God-fearing person in the community. What brings you to my house? He says, listen, I'm going to pay you. We do our thing and then that's it. You don't need to worry about my own thing. She tells him, by Allah, I will not do anything with you until you tell me what brought you here because I feel like I know the story. So he tells her, she says, okay, go and see if that guy is still in sujood because he's the same reason that I have become who I am today. That is none other than Iblis. Did she go around and expose him in the community and say the most God-fearing guy came to do something with me? No. She prayed. She said, oh Allah. I pray that nobody saw him come to my house because I do not he want his name to be ruined because he was deceived by Iblis. At that very moment, he also makes a prayer. He says, oh Allah, forgive her for every sin she has committed because she saved me from Jahannam. She immediately dies and the Prophet is the one who buried her. And the people said, Oh Prophet of Allah, she was known as a very bad woman in the community. How is it that you are the one who does her qusul and you are the one who wraps her and shrouds her and you are the one who goes into the grave and you place your hand in the grave and you say to the earth, be gentle to her for my sake. He said, because she preserved the faith of one individual. And she did not ruin his name. So Allah asked me to come and help her so that her name may be preserved in the community. So now you ask yourself. You have an opportunity to preserve the names of your beloved brothers and sisters in this community or you can ruin them. That's on the one hand. On the other hand. You can also preserve the name of Ahlul Bayt or you can ruin it with your actions. 
preserve the dignity of Ahlul Bayt. Put things on the internet that will make people proud to say, today I saw this and therefore I'm going to be a Shia of Ahlul Bayt. My final point and the point that I want to conclude with, and I speak to every single individual here, and I know we are not perfect human beings. But that's the whole reason we come to the Majalis. Because if we were perfect, we wouldn't need to be here. We come here to be reformed. We come here to be changed. Because Karbala has a lesson for each and every single individual, wherever you may be in the world. Hence why our Imams tell us, every day is Ashura. Every day there is a lesson to be taken from Ashura. And every land is Karbala. In every land that you go, there is a lesson to be taken from Karbala. What is that lesson? That lesson is that you can make change in the final moment of your life. And if you make that one correct change forever, humanity will remember you for that one good deed and they will forget every bad deed that came before. We take this lesson from Hurra bin Ziyad al-Riyahi alayhi salam Allah sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. There are two ways we can analyze the story of Hur. Either we can say to ourselves that in the final moment of your life, you can make a change. But to be honest, I think that that weakens the statement and the principles of Hur. Because it's very easy to do good when you know you're about to die. Correct? You know, how many uncles do we know we never went to Hajj when they were 35, 40. But when medical moths started hovering over their heads, they go ziyara six, seven times a year, Hajj 20 times a year. Because they know, I might as well pile up on the good deeds before I'm gone, right? Collect as many air miles before I'm gone. So therefore, doing good when you know death is imminent isn't really a great thing. Let's look at the life of Hur from a different angle. Hur was on an army of 35,000 strong. That means Hur, there was a chance if we calculate, and I'm terrible at maths. Remember, I said in the beginning, if you don't know about maths, don't talk about maths. So I'm not going to do that. But you guys work it out. Get 72 and work out the percentage from 35,000. That will give you the possibility of Hur dying in Karbala. 35,000 people facing 72, what is the possibility that Hur would have been killed on that day if he stayed in the army of Yazid? I will tell you zero. Zero. All he had to do is sit down, watch the events unfold, and walk home. Because a lot of people survived in that day from the army of Yazid. But Hur made a decision an active decision and because of that decision he died and he knew that the decision will cost him his life that is a far more noble statement than to say her changed in the last moment of his life no her made a decision that ended his life but he did not care if his life will end on that day because he knew he was making the right decision Sometimes in our lives we say, you know what, I'm going to change, I'm going to stop hanging around with the bad people, but the problem is, I'm going to lose my friends, I'm going to lose the status in the community, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to lose so much, but what if I told you the right thing is going to make you lose your life? Then you change. That's how much of a noble character Hur is. Hur, and only if you knew who Hur is, on the day of Ashura, and allow us just to dim the light slightly. On the day of Ashura, Hur was standing. And while he's standing there, he began. First, he goes to Umar bin Sa'd, Lanatullah Ali. And he says, Oh, Umar bin Sa'd, have you truly intended that you will kill Hussein? He says, yes, by Allah, I will fight Hussein a battle in which hands will be severed, heads will roll, bodies will be trampled, and women will be taken captives. 
When Hur heard this, he began to tremble like a leaf in the autumn. So the people said to him, they said, Oh Hur, why are you trembling like a coward? And Hur was sweating. That tells you the kind of state he was in. They said, Oh Hur, why are you in this state? He says to them, By Allah, I see myself choosing between heaven and hell, and I will never prefer anything over heaven. They said, Ya Hur, you are trembling, but by Allah, if the people asked us, who are the brave champions of Kufa, your name would be the first on that list. He said to them, I do not care about bravery. I see the son of Fatima to Zahra alone with no support. And by Allah, it is me who brought him to this land. It is me that forced the caravan of Imam Hussein from Kufa to Karbala. And I see see myself now at a crossroad. Either I abandon Hussein and condemn myself to Jahannam, or I die by the side of the son of Fatima, and with that earn my place in paradise. Do you think Hur just managed to live like this? No. Hur had to fight his way to Abba Abdullah Hussein, taking down with him more than 16 people he took down. When he came to Abba Abdullah Hussein, he threw himself from his his horse. He got on his hands and knees. He placed his forehead on the ground and he began to crawl towards Imam Hussein until his head was at the feet of Abba Abdullah. Imam Hussein said, Oh Lord, do not do this to yourself. Stand and be an equal to me. He said, Ya Abba Abdullah, how can I stand when I hear coming from your tent the voice of Zainab how many are the enemies and how few are our friends? Who says, Ya Abba Abdullah, I'm the one who brought fear into the heart of the daughter of Fatima Zahra, so allow me to be of the first to ransom myself. They say that when Hur went and forth, he fought them with such ferocity until they surrounded him and they knew that they cannot take him on in single combat. And then Hur, when he was slain, he called out, Assalamu alaykum ya Abba Abdullah. Assalamu alaykum ya Abba Fatima to Zahra. Imam Hussein hastened towards Hur. But Imam Hussein, when he helped Hur, what did he say to him? He said, Oh Hur, salutations upon you. May Allah have mercy on your mother. She called you Hur because Hur means free. And by Allah, he was free in the dunya, and as such, you will be free in the akhirah. And this is how much Imam Hussein alayhi salam loved his companions. But I tell you of one Masaib of Hur ibn Ziyad al-Riyahi. When we read the books of the Matal of Abba Abdullah, they say that Imam Hussein, when he was left alone with no one by his side, even the young infant Ali al-Azhar was shaheed. Imam Hussein was about to leave and he heard saying, Calling, Lord be upon us, Ya Abba Abdullah. After you leave, who will be there to defend the daughters of Rasulullah? When Imam Hussein heard the state of Zainab, he began to call out to his companions. He began to say, Oh Habib ibn Mubahir, O Muslim ibn al O Lord, where are you? Come see the state of your Imam. Imam Sajjad alayhi salam said, By Allah, although the bodies of the Sahaba of Imam Hussein were all headless bodies cut to pieces, when they heard about Abdullah al Hussein call up to them, they began to turn in pain as if they are suffering from the words of the Shuhada. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون ألا لعنة الله على القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا 
وعلى محمد أي منقلب سينقلبون إلهي we beseech you by the one who Imam Hussein عليه السلام chose as his representative by the beauty of her father by Zainab al-Kubra by Umm al-Masaib Zainab إلهي make our youth and our elders and make our community become one heart make us one collective community working not for personal interest but for the interest of one person sahib al-asr wal amr ajal allah ta'ala farajah al-sharif ilahi we beseech you by sayyid al-shuhada hasten the appearance of our imam sahib al-asr wal amr ilahi make us of those who will be a thing of beauty for him and not a source of shame upon him ilahi hasten the zuhur of our imam so that he may guide us towards the kingdom of allah as Allah has seen fit for us. Ya Allah, we ask you by Bimari Karbala, Imam Sajjad alayhi salam Allah. There are many people who have been constantly requesting us to remember them in the dua. As we said, a Sayyid Miski in Australia who's been diagnosed with cancer and many more and you know everybody else who you know in your community that is in need of the dua. Ilahi, we beseech you on this night by the wasila of Hurr, the companion of Abba Abdullah al-Hussein, Give them shafa'a as soon as possible. And give their, their families the patience and the forbearance that they need to see themselves through this period of difficulty and hardship. Ilah al I mean. We shall recite five times Amman Yujib al Muttara Ida Dawek Shufusu for the shafa'a of all, mar, uh, all the Mu'mineen and the Mu'minat with a salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم One loud voice أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء 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 يا الله سورة المباركة الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم معتمي حسين يا حسين